<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm here today to support the United Australia Party candidates for election to the federal parliament. I've got a long history and a, and a commitment to West Australia and working in Western Australia. For over 15 years, I visited this state, camped in the desert sometimes for six months at a time, looking for iron ore, and fortunately was successful. Our party's senator, D.O. Wang, championed Western Australia, receiving its fair share of the GST in the 2013 election. This was a time when Western Australia only received 40% back of the GST it repaid. Our pressure and that campaign resulted in Western Australia today receiving 80%. It never would have happened if it wasn't for D.O. Wang and our party raising that in the 2013-2014 federal election. Our pressure brought real results for the people of Western Australia. At this election, the United Australia Party will be fighting for 100% of GST to be paid back to West Australians uh, that they pay, and that's what they deserve to get. West Australians are every bit as good as people living in eastern states. And why should this state lose its credit rating? Why should this state not have the same benefits that other states have? And why does Western Australia have to go on supporting other states in, in uh, Australia and eastern states? I'll tell you why. It's because the Liberal and Labor parties get all their votes in, the Western, in uh, eastern states and they don't care about what happens here in Western Australia. Some of the key policies we'll be putting forward in this election will include the tax deductibility of home loans. Home ownership once in Australia was the, um, pre was, was the uh, preeminent thing of all families. Over 95 per cent of Australians once owned their own home. Today that figure is declining and we see more and more of our homes being bought by foreign nationals. But if you own your own home, you've got a certain stability, a certain investment in your society, and you, can, you have a need to provide for yourself and your wife and family. Home loans are tax deductible in the United States. They were once tax deductible in Australia, and they're tax deductible in Europe as well. But for some reason, our government wants to gouge Australians and give them a disincentive for owning their own home. We want to stop that from happening. We also want to change the date for the payment of provisional tax. Rather than companies and businesses being required to pay provisional tax before they've actually earned the money, we want them to be able to pay their tax at the end of the year after they've earned the money. You know, 15,000 Australian businesses are pushed to the wall every year. Over 120,000 Australians lose their job from those liquidations because many of them, many of the small businesses can't afford to pay tax on money they haven't earned, because they are desperately needing the capital to fund their business. But what that one move will do, it will release $70 billion into our economy. Can you imagine that $70 billion? And that will provide for a stimulus right across the board of our nation. It will create new jobs, new opportunities, new businesses. And also, it will create more revenue for the government in any event. Each time that $70 billion is turned over during that year, if it's turned over five times, there will be $35 billion more of money that will be created. And that's something we've got to think about. And we need to do policies that will actually create wealth in this country, provide opportunity and provide support for our people. In Sydney last week, I announced that we'll be increasing the pension by $150 a week. And one of the ways we'll be doing it is from the income and the revenue that we're receiving from that measure to boost our economy and release that $70 billion and getting bigger, making the pie bigger and prosperous for all Australians. We also need to think about this country. Japan has become the world's third largest economy by processing Australian minerals, by using Australian energy. Yet they suffer from the tyranny of distance they have a higher living standard than we have, and they pay higher wages to the workers. Yet we endlessly send our minerals from Western Australia, Queensland and other states, to China, to Japan and to Korea, where their governments stand behind their companies and they process those minerals that they might buy in Australia for $100 a tonne to final products that they sell to the world for over $20,000 a tonne. We are not using our advantage for our benefit, for our children's benefit. And the federal government's got a role to play 
by providing a guarantee for the establishment of these industries in Australia to their financiers like they do in Korea, Japan and China. You know, the Japanese, the, the Chinese and the Koreans first got that policy from Australia. In 1913 at Wyala in South Australia, the Commonwealth came up with a policy to support Australian industry, to make sure we had jobs here, and they, and they guaranteed BHP to commence operations at Wyala. Never, not even one cent, was ever paid under that guarantee by the Commonwealth of Australia. But it opened the key for the financing of BHP as one of the nation's biggest companies, most successful companies of the last century. And it opened the key for BHP's operations here in Western Australia in the 1960s and 70s for iron ore. But of course, the, the mode of operation was changed. Rather than taking our minerals and processing them, we were shoving them on a boat and saying the Australians are not smart enough to do that. We're sending it to Korea, we're sending it to Japan. And of course, Japan was suffering at that time from the uh, Second World War. But it had the in ingenuity to take our minerals and become a powerhouse in the economies of the world. The same thing is happening here in Australia now with China, that they're taking our, min our minerals at an ever-alarming rate and with them goes the opportunity to do some of the things we should be doing in Australia. You know, our superannuation funds in this country are the biggest in the world, but 80% of them nearly are invested offshore, not in Australia. They're providing investment and jobs and returns for people in North America, in Europe and other places. Surely the government that provides many concessions for people who play into superannuation should insist that a minimum of 50% of Australian super should be invested in this country, in our projects, to create our jobs, to create growth and revenue and further taxation, if you like, even for the government, so that we can have better schools and hospitals. All these things we can do, and more, but we have to be positive about it. And we have to stop the invasion of our country from foreign powers. All of us want international trade, and I've been very critical, as you know, about the Chinese Communist government, but we want trade with China. But we don't want China to own all of our ports. Because if they own all of our ports, they can control what we export and what we import. They can control our country. We don't want them to control our airports either. Because um, under the Aircraft Act, enacted by the Federal Parliament, they're not allowed to do it. But in spite of that, they do. They operate ports, they operate ports and they operate airports here in Western Australia. And that goes to the very heart of our sovereignty. We need to establish a policy of reciprocal rights, that we can't own a port in China, we can't own, own a, um, an airport, or we can't own even a house in China. But our best agricultural land, our very best agricultural land in New South Wales and Tasmania, where I've come in recent days, has been sold to uh, uh, companies owned by the Chinese government. They have an unlimited war chest to be able to destroy and to, and to take over the control of many Australian countries, companies and many enterprises. As you know, I personally had an experience over five years when they paid me no royalties. They took $5 billion worth of ore to J Japan. They weren't interested in dunning me for the money. They had plenty of money. They were interested in getting control of our properties, control of our resources, so they could bankrupt our company. But although we lost nearly a billion dollars of revenue in that time, we won in the Supreme Court of Western Australia and our, our position prevailed. But not all Australian companies were as fortunate as we were, had as much money that, or the tenacity or the leadership to be able to prevail. Many of them went into bankruptcy. Many of jobs have been lost in this state um, because of this activity. And the Australian government needs to address it. They need to ensure that we've got good relations with China and other countries in trading, but we maintain our sovereignty. We, we maintain control of our company. So, at the, uh, at the, uh, after the next election, we plan to review all of these policies to make sure that we, as Australians, as an Australian government or Australian members of parliament, demand that we put Australia first. And every single policy of our party is designed to put Australia first. We've got to stop the large financial payments that go to our politicians or the jobs they receive after they leave office. 
to sell us out. We know that Andrew Robb was paid $900,000 to approve to, when he left office. And before he left office, he approved the sale of the Port of Darwin. We know our allies in the United States were very upset about that because they had just committed 2,500 Marines to Darwin to protect and defend our country. And yet, we've seen the extraordinary situation of the last few years of Senator Dastorari in New South Wales, who was promoting the Chinese government's position in the South China Sea, the establishment of airports and ports which could threaten Australia's sovereignty and, and threaten our freedom. And here we see the same thing happening in, in Western Australia, where the Labor government has sold the rights to the Meriden Airport for one dollar, with no tender taking place so that other companies such as mine or other Western Australians could bid for that port, airport, and where they've allowed the development of an airport at Cape Preston, not on my land, right? And how they did that was by getting the Financial Review Board to approve the acquisition of a pastoral lease, which is used for grazing. They then got the Labor State Government to approve the building of an airport, which was, was, was illegal, which didn't go through the Foreign Investment Review Board and which never would have been approved. And all this was done 80 kilometres south of the, of the Caratha Airport, which BHP and Rio and Woodside used to fly in their workforce. I, from a commercial point of view, it's inexplicable while such an a, a air, airport would be developed so close to a public airport. And of course what's wrong to it as well is it's exclusive. It's not for the use of Australians. None of these airports are for the use of Australians. They're only for the use of the Chinese government owned companies. I'm speaking at Wagga Wagga next week to a, a group of people in the aviation industry who are concerned that airports have now been taken over in western New South Wales and training facilities have been set up to train foreign pilots from China and elsewhere and that those facilities are no longer available to train Australians. So there comes a time when we need to draw a line in the sand for our country. There comes a time when we need to demand that the two major parties forget about the donations and realise that there's a lot more to this country than just money or power. There's thousands of Australians. And how would we face the thousands of Australians that have given their lives in World War I and II if we sold our country? Thanks very much. Have we got any questions from the press? Yeah, how, how is City Placing ads, uh, how does that equate to direct interference in the Australian election? Well, we've, we've raised very clearly, I think you'd agree, the question of their involvement at Cape Preston, what they've been doing up there, and they've responded by making ads which put through a contrary argument of what their real intentions are up there. So they've entered into the debate, if you like, in an issue which is very important to the Australian people. And of course, a, a, a government-owned co uh, co uh, company should not be spending Chinese government money in opposing an Australian political party's view during election period. I find that very disturbing as an Australian. Uh, should you get into Parliament, Clive, what will you do to um, help solve the dispute into current adoption of mineralogy in Sydney? Well, nothing. That's a matter that's gone to the courts, right? Um, and it's been, you know, certain of it's been resolved by judgment of the Supreme Court, which is found in our favour. And I think we have to protect and defend the rule of law that operates in Australia. And if you go to China, of course, there's no rule of law. You have a, a, a one-day trial, and the verdict is decided by the Communist Party of China. And I don't want that to happen in Australia. And I don't think we uh, would want to some, some sort of precedent where there was any sort of political interference in our, in our judicial process. Are the comments by your candidate in the ACT, mm. I, I haven't been familiar with those comments, so, so maybe you can enlighten I mean, me. I can give you, you a said comment. That, uh, that uh, taxi drivers are future terrorists. That um, some women are femme nasties or dykes. That people from Saudi Arabia are, are talheads. Is that acceptable? Well, that's not acceptable to me. That's not part of our party policy. But whether or not he said that, in the context of what he said that, I'll take that up with him after this uh, conference today. Referring to Saudi Arabians as tea towelheads, so that's not fit to be in Australian Parliament if you're saying that, is it? Well, it's not. We need to have a. a, a, a uh, uh, we've got people that 
live in Australia from all different countries all over the world that contribute to our country and they're all Australians and we've got to respect them and, and make sure that we make people welcome so that we can all work and be united to work for the benefit of this country. I mean, um, you know, my, my antecedents came from Ireland and France. Right? Um, I'm sure yours came from different countries too. And we have to realise that uh, you know, once people are Australians, once they're committed to this country, we don't want division, we want unity. And the issues that I'm raising today about the involvement of the Chinese Communist government in this co country are just as important to Chinese Australians. And we've got Chinese Australians standing at our party who, who are poor, the, the rule of the Communist Party in China, because they kill their own people and because there's no rule of law and they're absolutely ruthless. And they've come to Australia to make a new life because they want a better future for their children. We've got to applaud people like that and help them. How many seats are you confident of picking up in Western Australia? Well, um, we're standing in 151 seats across Australia. The reason we're doing that is because we want to give the Australian people a choice. For many years, only the Liberal and Labor Party was, were spending 50 or 60 million equivalent on their campaigns, and there was never a chance for any diversity in this country. So. We wouldn't be standing in 151 seats if we didn't want to win 151 seats. We're giving everyone the opportunity. And this is early days. We're still two weeks out from the election, so it's too early to tell. Where are your Senate prospects best, uh, Mr Palmer? Well, we think we'll win a Senator at least in every state of the Commonwealth. And uh, our polls are indicating that there, may, there could be more. That's the polls that we're, we're undertaking. Right? So you'll see that change in news poll over the next two weeks as they that they seek to limit you. You know, um, News Poll, for example, initially said that didn't even poll our party. The, uh, the news basically said, why would Clive Palmer spend so much when no one would vote for any of his policies? And suddenly they find out there's a good support for our policies. They're not going to give us the full credit, and we don't really care. What we care about is what happens on polling day and what we can do for this country. That's what we care about. That's what it's for, of course. But dealing with Queensland Nickel, um, there's been a lot of misrepresentation about that, so we should just clear it up. I was a shareholder, personally, in a company who then had shares in Queensland Nickel. Now, you can imagine if you're a shareholder in BHP, you're not personally responsible for the debts of BHP or even for the operations. I was not a director of Queensland Nickel. I was a, a passive shareholder providing cash so that people could be employed. Um, and that's, that was my total role. But of course I've paid out $7 million in the last month because I wanted those people to have a, a decent life. They've been hit very hard by the floods in, in the towns in the recent weeks and the economy's in a very poor position. You know, Queensland Nickel paid $700 million of tax to the Australian government. Right? And when it went into liquidation, it used the FEG scheme and there was $60 million paid for workers. But are you suggesting that an Australian company is not entitled to Australian support and to use Australian law in its own country when it's in that situation? That's what the Act was set up for, and that's what it did. And of course the, the Australian government's received much, much more money than it's ever paid out for Queensland Nickel. And of course the 40-year track record there was exporting up to a billion dollars of exports a year, employing up to 3,000 people. I mean, if we're frightened in this country to climb the mountain, if we're frightened to attempt to do things, we'll fail. So, sure, some things will go right and some things will go wrong, but we've got to keep on doing the best we can to make our country a stronger country and to do a lot more. Uh, does that answer your question? Well, just to confirm, so you, you say you have paid out seven million. That's right, yeah. Sure, it's been paid into a solicitor's trust account. On that. And that um, includes everything. On that, um, how can you say, and I understand you said the trust fund um, is independent, um, but I believe your wife works for the law firm because the trust fund's set up under the Queensland uh, Law Society rules, it operates independently, it's independently audited, and, it, and it's uh, covered by those requirements. So any solicitor who's a member of, a, of the Supreme Court of, West, of uh, Queensland is governed by those, that operation. So if it's sitting in a trust, when will the workers actually get cash in their When they <laughs> ask for it. So they have to prove their... Well, of course they do. They have to prove that they once worked for Queensland Nickel that they didn't just work for the West of Australia, for example, and fly over and grab some money. You know, that's what they have to prove. So they can do that re relatively easy. And uh, 
the solicitor expects the payments to start flowing next week. We've got 69 claimants at the moment and they're being processed. It's also a bit complicated that they've got to make sure that tax is paid on any funds that are paid out to the ATO so the public's protected. Why does your foundation to benefit Aboriginal people only have $109 in it? Well, because we've been independently funding Aboriginal activity from, from other things. This is a private family uh, trust, so I could ask you why, why have you only got $109 in the bank? Well, uh, I particular have promised care. $100 million to benefit well, Aboriginal Well, people. we haven't promised that, but we've been funding Aboriginal activity from our operations in Queensland. We funded an Aboriginal team in the um, Indigenous uh, Rugby League Championships in Australia and we're doing a lot more than that. One of the interesting things about Indigenous policy, which I should raise and which we're standing on this election, is that Indigenous children and babies are dying at three times the, white, uh, the rate of white babies. And we regard that as a national disgrace because the state and federal governments haven't accepted to provide the health facilities that those people require. So this is what should be one of the major things of this election. You don't hear Shifty Shorten or you don't hear ScoMo raising this issue. But if your children were dying at three times the rate of other Australian babies, you'd be concerned about it. But to address that original health, you have promised $100 million for this foundation. It hasn't happened, so it's a broken promise, isn't it? Of course it's not a broken promise. It's got nothing to do with our political party. It's in a state agreement. Um, and of course it's in, in Western Australian law how that will take place. And everybody knows that the Chinese government failed to pay a billion dollars to our, com our, com our company and that, that particular provision was included to assist the Chinese government in gaining additional access to develop further projects in Western Australia. And you know, once they've paid us and once they're meeting their full obligations, we'll meet those obligations. No. <laughs> in my experience in business, that anyone only deals with this country or any transaction because they need it and they need us. And um, it's a, a weakness of our politicians not to understand that the whole Chinese economy is based on Western Australian resources. And as I said to you, that they're downstreaming our products, they're making a lot more money than we are. Now, it may surprise you that during the mineral boom, we were producing something like 300 million tonnes of iron ore for export to China. But we were getting more revenue in this state than we are today when we're producing 800 million dollars, eight, sorry, 800 million tonnes of iron ore exports to China. The price was much higher. It's in the Chinese government's interest to increase the supply as high as it can be to keep the price down and to ensure that this country doesn't get its just desserts. That's how international trade works. So their alternatives in getting iron ore is to go to Brazil and pay an extra $20 a tonne for freight, which over 800 million uh, tonnes, I don't know, what is it, about $16 billion a year more in freight? I don't think they'll be doing that. Your statement says uh, foreign ownership is in breach of our law. What does that mean for foreign investment? What it means is if you're going to invest in Australia, you should go through the Foreign Investment Review Board. That's what our laws say. And that's what most of their laws say in China. So, you know, th this is... Um, activities which I've highlighted at the airports etc which haven't got foreign investment review board approval. The problem is that we have the requirement to get foreign investment uh, FIRB approval but there's no sanctions if you don't do it. There's no one auditing that and if you just go like they did, buy a pastoral lease and get the state government to give you a construction approval, you may be breaching FIRB but there's no sanction against you. But, but this says, uh, this infers uh, uh, no ownership from investment. Well, they shouldn't get ownership if they're breaching the law. That's the reality of it. And they shouldn't be making the investment unless they're making it in accordance with the law. And as I said, if you go to Guangzhou or Beijing, you'll find that they will shoot you if you break their law. If you, if you invest more than $795,000, you can be insured of a, a one-day trial. You remember that fellow from Canada, he was brought back before the court, and in one day they sentenced him to death. That's the sort of judgment, and that's the sort of justice you get in China. And uh, if we don't realise that, we'll, we'll, be, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be very vulnerable in the future. What proportion of foreign investment goes through the board? Well, theoretically, all of it's supposed to go through the board. But um, I've only found these two examples, which I've given you, Meriden Airport and the one up at Cape Preston, where they actually bought land, then developed, and didn't get the development approved. For example, if they'd, went, if they'd said to the Foreign Investment Review Board, 
we intend to build an airport on this land, and they got FIRB approval, that'd be approval for the airport and for the land. But what they said is we want to buy a pastoral lease. Then they went to the West Australian government, who, uh, whose Labor whip is a former member of the Communist Party, right, and got them to approve the airport to be constructed, like a construction approval, but they still didn't have an investment approval for the airport. And the Aircraft Act, 1995, forbids foreign-owned um, governments from owning airports in Australia. So they've breached our law, basically. And they do that regularly. If your promise on the GST to mm -hmm. return 100 cents in the dollar to WA... Well, that's what we want to do, yeah. yeah. Does that apply to all other states as well, WA? Well, we think that with combined with our other policies, that's how it should work, right? So that, that, that's how we think it should work, because originally the GST was set up, if you remember it, to eliminate state taxes, right? And that's never been applied by any of the state governments, but that's what should happen. Payroll tax, land tax, they were all supposed to go when John Howard set it up. It never happened. What we think the states need to do is have an incentive um, themselves to perform better. And if Western Australia performs better than, say, New South Wales, why shouldn't Western Australians get the benefit of that? The GFT is one section of it, right? There's additional revenue from the Commonwealth, and of course that requires equalisation, where some states will be worse off than others, and that's how we deal with that. But the GST in particular was related to goods and services happening in WA, and, and it was intertwined with a state tax arrangement originally, and we think that's how it should be. How can you promise 100 cents in the dollar to WA? I mean, it's, it's the Commonwealth Grants Commission that sets that, as you've said. Well, we can eliminate the Grants Commission if we want to, if we're in government. You know, <laughs> you've got to think a bit broader, a bit wider. In um, 2013, they said, how can you promise you'll increase the GST? And we made political pressure at that election on the Liberal Party. We won a senator. And of course, they did all they could to increase the GST for Western Australia to 80%. So by putting political pressure on and by raising these issues, you get results. So it's in Western Australia's interest to put political pressure on the Liberal Party or the Labor Party to say, we want all of our GST here in Western Australia. You've got to remember, at the same time, over that period, Western Australia's credit rating went down from a AAA, I think, to a AA rating, right? Which resulted in a lot more interest payments for the state, which meant that there were less hospitals, that there were less schools. And at the same time, GSC, uh, um, Western Australia was sending large amounts of GST to eastern states. If, you know, I'd be concerned about that. So would your message to voters in South Australia and Tasmania be that they'll probably receive less GST? No, my message to voters in South Australia is that they lift their performance, that they have better, better investment policies, they have cheaper power. In, in South Australia yesterday, we announced a nuclear power policy for South Australia, where they export most of their uranium overseas, where the largest employer is the, is the federal government, the second largest employer is the state government, the third largest employer is regional government where there are three generations of people unemployed in Elizabeth, where the cost of energy now is higher than it is in New York, and where the reliability of energy is very much lacking. So no investment, no manufacturing could be set up there. Yet if they had nuclear power, which was cheaper, using their own uranium, they could set up a very competitive uh, manufacturing industry, and people would come and be located there because they had that advantage. So we encourage South Australia, as the example you gave, to, to look to their own resources and to develop their own industry and to rethink what they're doing. That's, that's what we're trying to say. And, that, and of course, by doing that, they'll have more, more demand and more GST. So you're confident that picking up a Senate seat next state, um, our leading senator here from your team, you know, the fellow Tom Queensland, he's been here for about six months. Why is he chosen as your lead candidate? Not well, of course, he's worked with me for about 15 years over our projects, mineralogy projects in Western Australia and got an intimate knowledge of the resource industry. He's also worked internationally raising large amounts of capital, up to $150 billion. I think if you read The Australian, they recognise he's raised in um, New York and London, other places like that. And Western Australia is a big state. Yeah, it's, got a, it's had a lot of vision. The Premier Forest in Western Australia first had the vision to build the railway to Kalgoorlie, and he funded that by, by that vision. And the Australian government and others said he couldn't do it, right? So we think you need someone that's got that skill and ability that can tap the finance you need for bigger projects. 
And one of the bigger projects is that we should be processing our resources, as I said, here in Western Australia. And we should be providing more jobs for people in Perth. And that requires people that have got knowledge of international finance and know how to put it together. Okay? I'd better wind it up because I've got to go somewhere else for an interview. But God bless Western Australia and God bless all the journalists here. <laughs> See you later. Authorised by Clive Palmer for the United Australia Party, Brisbane.